Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is May 11th. Today in garden history, we celebrate the birthday of Salvador Dali, the Spanish surrealist artist. He was born on this day, May 11th in 1904. Educated in Madrid, Salvador was a son of Catalonia, and he never lost his love for the beauty of his homeland. Early in his career, Salvador gravitated toward surrealism, and by 1929, Salvador Dali was regarded as the leading figure in the art form. Like Sigmund Freud, Salvador Dali used the landscape as a metaphor for the human mind. Dali once said about the coastline of his beloved Catalonia, I personify the living core of this landscape. Today, there are two museums devoted to Salvador Dali's work, the Dali Theater Museum in Figueres, Spain, and the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. And in 2020, the Marie Selby Botanical Gardens in Sarasota, Florida, presented Salvador Dali, Gardens of the Mind. The centerpiece of the exhibit was Flor Dali, a fantastically colored series of flower lithographs from 1968. In Flor Dali, Salvador created imaginary enhancements to favorite blossoms. He created the Dali Unicorns, which featured a twisted horn in the middle of a Dahlia bloom. He created Lilium Musicum. It has vinyl records and sheet music for petals. And then Pisum Sensual is a sensory plant. It's got fingers with painted nails and voluptuous lips. And then, finally, Pansy is a self-portrait with pansies for the eyes and the mouth. And it was on this day in 1907 that the American botanist Nathaniel Lord Britton was in Nantucket preparing for a lecture on plant protection. Nathaniel had brought along 50 colored lantern slides from the Van Brunt collection to use in his presentation. Nathaniel and his wife Elizabeth co-founded the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx, New York. Now, on this day, back in 1907, Nathaniel's time in Nantucket was brief, just for this day, but he wrote these observations in a letter. On Nantucket, the Mayflower is the most abundant of spring wildflowers. It carpets the moors on the south side of the island and lends a rich, spicy fragrance to the ocean breezes. It is in less danger from picking than from the surface fires, which are common occurrences in the spring. The later blooming wildflowers suffer more or less at the hands of summer tourists, but I was glad to observe that the residents of Nantucket as a whole are keenly alive to the importance of preserving the natural beauties of the island, and they carefully guard the localities for more rare plants, especially the scotch heather and the two European heathers which grow there. And it was on this day in 1923 that a schoolyard garden outside of Loch Ness in Scotland gave the following update. As sheep are constantly breaking into the garden, work has stopped till the walls are rendered sheep-proof. Well, this adorable little entry was discovered by the modern-day owner of the property, Catherine Stewart, and she shared it in her delightful month-by-month garden book called A Garden in the Hills. It was published in 2006. Catherine reflected on the journal entry regarding the sheep, and she wrote, I know exactly what he meant. More than 60 years later, the sheep, the more agile variety, are still sometimes managing to leap over the wall, where the superimposed netting has given away. 
That can mean goodbye to all the summer lettuce and the winter greens, not to mention the precious flowering plants and all the work that went into producing them. Well, the little school in the Scottish Highlands closed in 1958, and a few years later, Catherine and her husband Sam bought the property known as the Croft at Abraken near Loch Ness. There, Catherine began her writing. Reflecting on her first days in the garden at Croft, Catherine wrote, When we arrived, wild raspberries, willow herb, and sweet sicily had largely taken over. To bees and butterflies, and to many kinds of birds, this was a paradise. For us, it held all the thrill of uncharted territory. Every day, a fresh discovery was made. Worn-out toys, pieces of pottery, a pile of school slates from a dump against the top wall, evidently discarded when jotters came in, and most interestingly of all, several scrapers dating from prehistoric times. Meanwhile, I often imagine my predecessors here looking at the same outline of hills, the same scoop of the burn in the hollow, listening to the same sounds of lark and owl, the bark of deer, and many more long gone, the howl of wolf, maybe the growl of bear. The heather would have been their late summer delight, making drinks of tea or ale, thatching for their roofs, and kindling for their fires. Sometimes I envy them the simplicity of their lives, though the hardships must have been great. They didn't have a Christmas to celebrate, but they knew all about the winter solstice, and they must have been happy to see the bright berries on the holly, as we do today. Well, late in life, Catherine Stewart went on to become a teacher and then her town's postmistress. She died in 2013 and is survived by her daughter, Hilda. And today we also celebrate the birth of Margaret Visser, the South African-born writer and broadcaster who was born on this day, May 11th in 1940. Margaret lives in Toronto, Paris, and southwest France, and she writes about the history, anthropology, and the mythology of everyday life. Margaret once wrote, Salt is the only rock directly consumed by man. It corrodes but preserves, desiccates but is wrested from the water. It has fascinated man for thousands of years, not only as a substance he prized and was willing to labor to obtain, but also as a generator of poetic and mythic meaning. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Little Library Cookbook by Kate Young. This adorable book came out in 2018, and the British food writer and author B. Wilson gushed, What a joy this is for hungry readers everywhere. Stylish, fun, and clever. If there is comfort food, there is also comfort reading, and the Little Library Cookbook is it. The publisher writes, Would you like to taste Paddington Bear's Marmalade or Clam Chowder from Moby Dick? You'll learn how to prepare the afternoon tea served at Manderley and the decadent tarts the Queen of Hearts would love, all while reading food-related excerpts from your favorite books. Well, Kate Young was inspired to write this book based on her amazing food blog that's called The Little Library Cafe. And in the Little Library Cookbook, Kate offers up over a hundred recipes inspired by beloved works of fiction. So there are dishes from classics and contemporary bestsellers with stories for people of any age. Among many others, you'll find Turkish Delight from Narnia, Mint Juleps from The Great Gatsby, Bread and Butter Pudding from Atonement, Curried Chicken from Sherlock Holmes, Pippi Longstocking's Pancakes, Coconut Shortbread by Sarah Perry in her book The Essex Serpent, Black Ice Cream from The 101 Dalmatians, Cinnamon Rolls from Donna Tartt's The Goldfinch, 
the Godfather's spaghetti and meatballs, the railway children's apple pie, and honey rosemary tea cakes inspired by Winnie the Pooh. This book is 320 pages of food in fiction brought to life by the sweet, funny, and intrepid blogger, cook, caterer, and writer, Kate Young. You can get a copy of The Little Library Cookbook by Kate Young and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $15. And this is a great gift book, by the way. All right, we end the show today with a fun botanic spark that celebrates a weather event that happened over 100 years ago. It was on this day, May 11th in 1894, that Bovina, Mississippi, reported a case of turtle hail. Newspapers reported that during a severe hailstorm, a 6-inch by 8-inch gopher turtle fell to the ground, completely encased in ice, at Bovina, Mississippi, which is located about 7 miles east of Vicksburg in western Mississippi. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening to The Daily Gardener. And just a reminder that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the buy me a coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day.